for the evening. Kevin Delaney is editor-in-chief and co-founder of Quartz. If you don't know Quartz, you need to know Quartz. It's a digital news outlet for business people in this new complex global economy. It's actually owned by Atlantic Media, as in Atlantic Magazine. Kevin is not only the editor-in-chief, he was a co-founder of Quartz, but he did, does this coming off of a very um, long career working for the Wall Street Journal, 16 years of the Wall Street Journal, and also as managing editor of the Wall Street, of, of WSJ.com. So, Kevin, we're in good hands, okay. and I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Um, so we're going to dive in. We have just under an hour here to address this question of uh, refreshing leadership and what great leadership um, that, that contributes to a dynamic capitalism, what it looks like. We have a great panel here. Um, we have just under an hour. We're going to leave some time at the end for questions. So if you do have questions in the course of the discussion, please note them down and we'll bring uh, microphones around to you uh, before the end. Uh, before we dive in, I'm going to quickly uh, introduce our, our excellent panel. Their, their extended bios are in the program, so if you want to study them in further detail, please do that. I'm going to start with Linda Ubre, who's next to me. She's Dean of San Francisco State College of Business. Uh, she's a startup junkie, and she's been involved in more than 30 new ventures. Uh, she co-founded and served as president and CEO, COO of Bright Smile, which is a really successful startup. She's president of Tricom Venu uh, Ventures, general manager of new business development for the Los Angeles Times, director of operations for Walt Disney Publishing, and much more. Uh, she attended Harvard Business School, where she and Peter were actually classmates. Despite that, both of them <laughs> have miraculously have gone on to be very successful in their careers, <laughs> as, you'll, as you'll see. Judy didn't say that I attended Yale, so. Oh. Um, uh, and so, and I'll move on to Peter. So Peter uh, Tufano is, he's the Dean of the Said uh, Business School at Oxford University. Uh, he's also the founder of Doorway to Dreams, which is a Ford Foundation grantee program, which does product innovation around consumer finance for low-income individuals. Um, the last decade of Peter's research has focused primarily on consumer finance and some really interesting innovations there that are, that are emerging. Um, Peter served prior to moving to Oxford. He served on the Harvard Business School faculty for 22 years, um, and he has many degrees from Harvard. Um, and lastly, our host here, Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation. Um, as you probably know, it's the second largest philanthropy in the United States, has over $11 billion in assets and $500 million in annual giving. He was previously at Rockefeller Foundation, Abyssinian Development Corporation, which is a consumer development organization in Harlem, and he worked, uh, had a successful career in finance and corporate law prior to that. Is that right? The last part? Uh, yes. Oh. yes. Okay, good, <laughs> thank you. So we're gonna dive in. Our discussion is gonna be focused around three or four core questions. The first one I'm gonna ask each of them to talk about their own organizations and how they're, um, how they're interfacing with this, this question of refreshing leadership. We're gonna talk specifically about what kind of leaders uh, we need. We're gonna talk about some of their own practices. And then we're gonna um, spend some time on the role of business schools in shaping leaders and some of the specific uh, ways in which business schools of, of actually different types and with diff different type sizes and different types of student bodies are able to, um, to tackle this question. Um, so Linda, I'm gonna start with you. Okay. This question of revitalizing a leadership, how, um, how can we uh, create, encourage, nurture, identify leaders whose values and practices are, are consistent with the best of capitalism that's inclusive and, and vibrant? Um, how are you, how is you, are you and your organization interfacing with that question? Well, um, I was sitting here most of the day and I know you guys think those of us from California are different let me just say my reaction to today is we are really different. <laughs> um, and I say that because a lot of talk about diversity and these questions of values. Uh, we don't talk about diversity, we live it. We don't talk about diversity, we talk about equity, we talk about inclusion. And I say that because I do have to give quick background. I have 6,000 students in my college. We're probably one of the largest business schools in the country. Uh, I know we are in Northern California. And a lot of my students are first generation. 
Uh, we have majority, we don't say, we don't use the word minority in the state of California. We have a majority of students of color. I have non-traditional students. I have a lot of veteran students. I have 57% women in my MBA program, which are probably one of the best in terms of um, gender representation. So we just live it. And when we talk about leadership, and earlier, um, I think it was uh, Beth was talking about the data, about what corporations were saying. And before she left, I told her, it was good to see that data that 23% of corporate executives are, are talking about they need people with internships. Um, that validates what I hear. I'm, I'm a former corporate person. I do not have a PhD and I'm very proud of it. I only have one Harvard degree versus other people I know. <laughs> um, and so a lot of what I do when I was hired is go out and talk to companies. And what they are telling me is we need leaders who look like the world. We need leaders who look like our customers. And they see a school like ours as where they go to try to find those leaders. So, so a big part of our job, our students are very bright. What I, what I like to say, because I'm first generation to go to, to college and I end up at the Harvard Business School as did my husband. And what I like to say is we don't have students who had mom and dad at the dinner table reading from the Wall Street Journal. So we have to be parents in some ways in terms of connecting that pipeline of future leaders to companies. And frankly, our students and our companies in the Bay Area and in California are way out ahead of us on this because they're demanding that and the students are demanding that. So Great. Excellent. Peter, do you want to pick up? So first, apologies if you expected a British accent. <laughs> you won't get one. Uh, Where is your accent from, by the way? Upstate New York. OK. Uh, so um, we don't have 6,000 students. We're a relatively small school. Um, Oxford is, as you might imagine, a place that draws from all over the globe. So everybody in our school is a minority, which I want to talk about a little bit later. It fundamentally changes the dynamics of not only leadership, but education in general. Um, I found the conversation today curious, to be honest. It was re refreshingly American. Um, the issues that we describe today are very different in the world that I live in, which is to say continental Europe and the UK. I just literally was in China yesterday morning um, talking about these issues. We're going to be in India in a few weeks um, because you know what's happened in India is these questions about responsibility are right to the fore. Um, and so to me, what this means is trying to create in a relatively small school with a big footprint and uh, an ability to have points of view heard far beyond our size is how do we get discussions going. So literally you know, on Tuesday, uh, we were there talking to the people who run the biggest state-owned enterprises in China where the same issues about responsibility were being raised. But what does responsibility mean in China? It's slightly different than probably what we mean here today. Um, so back to the fundamental question, how do we interact with this? I think there's, it's at two levels. One level is in terms of what behaviors to avoid. So how is it to engage people in a discussion about the behaviors that, that probably are unacceptable? Um, that's the do no harm part of the work that we do. And, and we can talk about that. And it's more complex globally than it is um, just in one country. And the second part is how you orient people about not just not doing any harm, but those big mission statements that I can't remember one of the, the speakers put up. Those mission statements are big, and ours is even bigger, which is to address world scale problems. So how do you possibly do that? Um, and so maybe as the, the evening we'll, we'll come rolls back on, to some we of can these come back. Yeah. But how do you not, yeah. kind of, uh, how do you avoid problems? You know, yeah. the Hippocratic part of it. And then the really aspirational part. How do we create organizations that are going to fundamentally change the world and not get penalized for having done that? And, wait, and what's interesting, one thing that, to highlight that is that you're talking about the international reach of the education through the influence of Oxford, but also your students' backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Do you, just to, before we continue, Linda, do you have the same, given the diverse nature of the backgrounds, do you feel an international reach for Yeah, in fact, it's kind person? of funny because one thing I learned um, being at San Francisco State, and I just got back from China two weeks ago, is there's two American phrases that mean a lot in China. One is San Francisco and one is state. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we actually have a huge footprint, particularly in Asia. So, yeah. and, and you know, the Bay Area has two of the large cities that have Chinese American mayor. Yeah. So there's a lot of interaction because of Mayor Lee in San Francisco, Mayor Kwan in Oakland. 
That's great. To Asia. So. How does Apple fit on the American words that are oh, meaningful? Oh, I China? don't know. <laughs> okay. Darren, do you want to talk well, about sure. the interface with leadership? Yeah. Well, I think it's for, for the Ford Foundation, this question of leadership is, is a very broad one for us. It's not just about business education. And when you, I'm very happy that our two deans of business schools are talking about diversity. And so it's wonderful if you are, have a diverse student population and it's wonderful if they're global in nature and come from all over the world, but if they actually don't have the right values and they aren't being taught and they aren't having leadership modeled, it really doesn't matter. I mean, I, I quite frankly am not interested in being around another African American or gay man who has bad values and is a really, um, I think, a greedy person not really concerned about the world around uh, him. Um, so to my mind, it is that core issue of what kind of leaders are we generating today for tomorrow how do we think about a population of people who can lead, motivate, manage, model a behavior, uh, a style, a quality uh, of leadership that inspires and that helps society be lifted up and, and who think in a very different disruptive way? And how do we think about the ecosystem in which they have to operate where incentives are actually the right incentives to get them to be the best they can be rather than the worst they can be. And so that's what we're interested in, the broader ecosystem. And what I'm excited about is there seems to be a movement afoot. It is, it is somewhat atomized at this point, and Judy has been leading the charge for a while uh, very courageously uh, during a time when Milton Friedman and, and that whole idea of, of what the, the role of the firm um, should be uh, seemed to uh, be the dominant paradigm. I think, I, I hope we have uh, put the nail in the coffin of that idea, um, but maybe not. Great, Linda, did you wanna? Yeah, I wanted, you know, it's interesting. When I, when I was saying that we're different and our students are out in front of Front of us, I know earlier one of the earlier sessions we were talking. Um, someone mentioned about bringing in low-wage people into the classroom to interact with MBA students. My students come from those homes, where you know where their parents were the low-wage earners or the undocumented workers, and, and a lot of them themselves are the undocumented workers. And I think that's that's why a lot of our students are out ahead of us. It's because they see that they have an opportunity, but they're working 30 hours a week. They're supporting family. A lot. We have a lot of single mothers. But it's interesting because I think that that informs all of us. Like I feel like they're leading us as educators. And you know, I'm, I'm, I like to tell stories. But you know, people always ask me, "How do you like the job, especially versus corporate?" It's the hardest job, job I've ever had, other than being a mom. But what keeps me going is, you know, the day I had a horrible day, and my associate dean and I went and hid in the Cesar Chavez Institute next to Malcolm X Plaza. And uh, <laughs> got a cup of coffee, and we're like way up in the third floor, and this young Latina student kept walking back, and she said, are you the dean of the College of Business? And I said, yes, and she goes, you keep me going. And I'm like, okay, what are you talking? She goes, just because you're in this role. And I started talking to her, and I said, are you gonna take summer class? She goes, I can't, I'm undocumented. But, and she's one of our business students, but she is starting a program to develop scholarships for undocumented students. So they can't, because they can't get federal aid. And so that's how in some ways, so I'm glad you brought that up because I, I think we take it for granted, but it's the truth that our students really do, they live the values of what well, they're here for. And they live the it. values, but I, I am a graduate, I proudly say I've never attended a, a day of private school in my life. So I, I've, I've not attended Harvard, but I know lots of people who have and who like me grew up poor and I'll tell you a story. Last month, I was at a cocktail party of one of, of my friends uh, who grew up in a housing project and now lives in a 14-room apartment on Central Park West. And there was a party that was all African Americans. And if I would closed my eyes and, and listened to the, the dialogue, um, it would have sounded like uh, I was across the park on Central Park North uh, with a very different population of people. 
the conversation was about private schools and getting their kids into Harvard and, and, and the vineyard in the summer <laughs> and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so this was a population of people who were all affirmative action kids, who all, for the most part, went to Harvard and Yale. And yet along the way, what they actually learned, it appears, was, was not, in fact, what I, I would have liked them to have learned when they were in business school at Harvard. Um, and so I think we can talk about diversity, um, but at the end of the day, what these people out here, the challenge you all have, you educators, is a really tough one because you have to think about disrupting an entire ecosystem that, that affirms and validates and valorizes wealth, uh, agglomeration, accumulation, uh, 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 deification of some of the very things that businesses seem to produce. And I am a, a radically optimistic capitalist. I am responsible for a $12 billion endowment, the stewardship of that. And so believe me, I believe deeply in our system. But the trends are very worrisome for our democracy because our system is in fact undermining our democracy. Peter, so Peter, you, you um, identified two things which I think follow on nicely from this. One is this question of, uh, as you think about leadership, one is doing no harm, and the second thing is the, the affirmative mission, the, the, the values that, that go beyond harm to actually uh, contribution to, to society. And Darren just talked about probably the do no harm part a little bit. Can you, can you build on sure. that a little bit and we'll move through these two areas and, and we'll pull Linda and Darren in. Sure. By the time that someone's reached us, they're 27, 28 years old. Um, one might think that a lot of their values are set. And I should also say that you know, values coming out of the Middle East, values coming out of Africa, values coming out of China, these are not the same. Um, fortunately, a lot of them come to our school because of the activities of the school. We run something called the Skoll Center. We have the Skoll World Forum. There, a certain population is drawn to us. But even so, how is it that you enter into a discussion um, with people about values? One way to do that is what you've just seen, this case study method and, and putting them in difficult situations. We try something else. Um, it's always struck me as being somewhat bizarre that we believe that the only people who have anything to say about business and values are business school professors. Now, you know, it, it, just think about that. You know, the entire parts of the world are focused on the question of how you make decision making with values. And they're not sitting in business schools. But we assume that the only people who have anything of, of importance to say must be business school professors. Being very self-critical here, right? So, you know, we have a strategy which is quite simple. We call it embedding with the university. So we decided, why don't we ask our friends around the entire university to join us in this conversation? So we bring in philosophers, we bring in theologians, we bring in music conductors, we bring in historians, because fundamentally what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the students unsteady, because that's how you get values discussions to take place. If you're sure about what you know, then you're never gonna have any change in the way that people think. We need to get them unsteady. So the Coca-Cola discussion, it got you uncomfortable. And in the same way, whether it's Shakespeare or history or a lot of other things, you don't have to use case method to do that. You just have to get people off their, their point at which they're comfortable. We found that re is remarkably helpful because it not only teaches the students, but it teaches the faculty. So I have faculty who are team teaching with humanities professors, business school professors with humanities professors. This is an unholy alliance. On the other hand, what it does do is it raises these important questions of values. And we talk about values and value and obviously the tension between them. So where do you find these teachable moments? Where do you find these ways of getting students engaged? And I'm, I'm staying on the first part, the do yeah. no harm part, about what behaviors are appropriate and what behaviors are, are off base. And I suspect that if, if you were at that party um, with your friends, there'd be certain conversations that wouldn't make you particular, particularly uh, well liked in that, in that party, but you could have sparked a conversation that would have gotten people thinking and they would have went home perhaps a bit uncomfortable, but on the other hand, probably having reflected a little bit on some of the things that they, they were taking for granted. We're gonna come back to business education in more detail later, but just while we're on the topic, Peter, are there any 
more far out and successful examples of unconventional uh, topics addressed within the business school. You mentioned music and, uh, and humanities. Are there any um, specific examples of experimentation that, that you think have been particularly? Remarkably, Shakespeare works really well. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, there's Merchant the, of Venice, is that the? Uh, well, that one can work too, Coriolis. There's a bunch yeah. that'll work. Um, and it turns out that you know Indian folk literature works as well. Indian folk literature. Yeah, from India. It's, you know, it's, yeah. So it, it, there's lots of ways to get people unsettled and also to get them culturally thinking about places other than their life and their world. Yeah. Karen, just to come back to you and then we'll go to Linda. This question of what is, a, uh, what is the kind of leader that we want to encourage? So you, you reacted against the, you know, in, in, uh, against the, the sort of values that were embodied at this, this cocktail party. But can you, um, can you talk a little bit more about the pressures? You talked, started talking about the pressures and about the sort of affirmative missions um, that, business, that business leaders need. Well, I think that it's, let's be clear, it is, it is very hard to be a leader t today. Leaders today have to be comfortable embracing complexity in ways that they didn't mm -hmm. in the past. One of my mentors is a 80 plus year old former CEO, white, Harvard Business School. He was a leader in a very different world. He really didn't need much emotional intelligence to be successful. No one ever tested him on his emotional intelligence, or I don't think he ever heard of the EEOC. Uh, I mean, the, the kinds of things that a leader today must deal with, um, the complexity of it all is so profoundly different than it was. It truly, I often say, because I'm, I, fi I find that the world in which we live, which is seemingly so bifurcated into black and white, I mean, it's this or it's that, and I live in this gray world. And I I'm, I'm often uh, challenged to navigate because I don't live in mm. that world that's black or white. Well, they actually lived in a world that was black or white. I mean, there was communism or capitalism. And th I mean, there, it, there, it was, their world was, so today to lead in a, a world that is gray with the multiple layers of complexity. Um, I was talking with a friend who's a CEO and he made a, a gaffe recently. The gaffe was that he was speaking to, and there, there was a group of people, and he was speaking to a staff member, and someone pointed at this other staff member and said, oh, John just got engaged. And he turned and he said, oh, who is she? Well, I mean, that's a reasonable thing to say. Right? If you're a 60-something-year-old white guy who went to Wharton. I mean, I, no, I mean, right? I mean, well, it turned into, it was a huge gap that he asked this subordinate, when in fact the subordinate is, is engaged to, a, this man is engaged to a man. I mean, how do you manage? I mean, don't yeah. think about it. You've got to manage with that precision of empathy and of, of contemporariness of issues. And, and so, again, I mean, it, I could have said that. Anyone, I mean, yeah. um, but you know, I mean, so as a leader yeah. now, he has to go back and talk to communications and talk to the lawyer to make sure that no one, <laughs> you know, and so, you know, thousands of dollars of, of lawyers' bills later, PR people, HR gets a phone call, yeah. And he hasn't even, he's not even working on selling the widgets <laughs> that he's supposed to be, right? Yeah. Uh, Linda, I want to pull you into this question. One of, the, one of the sort of mantras or conventional wisdom of business of, you know, arguably the last 30 years or so has been the pursuit, the, 
the mission of a business is to serve the shareholders. You have been an entrepreneur, have run businesses. You know you're familiar with that dynamic. Um, is that is that something that that you know as you as you think about what leaders um, the attributes of the sort of leaders that we're talking about um, and the pressures on them is that one of them that is that's present? Yes, but we're just different. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, one of my one of my most memorable days in business school. 32 years ago, first year Harvard Business School finance <coughs> class, was we did a typical class case study on should you build this plant? And I'll never forget this because one of our class, Fritz Henderson, who graduated Baker Scholar, went on to be CEO of General Motors and had the highest score in the CPA exam in the state of Michigan when he took it. Um, and he was called on, would you build this plant? Yes, why? Because the positive, you know, net present value is positive, blah, blah, blah. And the professor, said, yeah, but on page 20 of the case, it says if you build the plant, your union's going to strike, so you have no cash flows. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and of course, Fritz being Fritz was like really, really shocked. And so it, it's ironic with some of the stuff Darren was talking about. And you said two words I think are very key. You said gray area and empathy. And I think those are two of the most important things to think about in terms of leadership. And I, and I bring up the case, and it kind of goes to the earlier conversation, um, about case method. What case method taught me was how to think and how to make decisions and back them up. Mm -hmm. um, when I talk to companies, whether it's Wells Fargo, Kaiser, Apple, Google, when they say we need leaders who look like our customers, they also say, I can teach them finance and accounting. I can't teach empathy. I can't teach, well, here's a big one, networking skills. And I have 26 and 24 year old sons. Um, but with all are, this technology, who have networking skills or? they do, thank God. Um, yeah. But, you know, but it, it's interesting with all this technology and social media, employers are telling us that kids now, they don't know how to talk to each other. They don't know how yeah. to network, even like talk to human beings. The whole empathy, it's the soft skills. Um, I'm, I know I'm not answering your question, but I'm answering what he said. So, <laughs> um, so more important. Yeah, okay. so, it, so it's interesting. And I think those, that's why I thought it was so important to say gray area and empathy, and it ironically, it was the Harvard Business School that taught me that because of who I am, and because I sat in a classroom as one of the few African-American women in my class, coming from a, because I went to UCLA undergrad, I came, I came from a land-grant institution, not the Ivy League, and I was, you know, a, a people assumed I shouldn't be there, and a former presidential candidate, when I interviewed with his company, instead of making me the job offer, said, we're not gonna hire you because you're a black woman. So that gave me the empathy and taught me the gray area. Yeah. So I think it comes down to who's in the classroom, which we haven't talked about, but yeah. who's in the classroom? Who, are you, who do you admit as students and who are your faculty? So I, wanted to, I want to turn now to business education specifically and how to apply some of these observations about uh, the, the quality of leadership and that, that and Maybe you can pick that up, Linda, because you're talking about empathy um, and uh, networking skills. Where do you, where does that fit in accounting 101, finance 201, management strategy 301? How do you, how do you, how do you fit that in a, in a curriculum that, that is, you know, predates your deanship? Well, and, and you missed Denise's earlier question, my faculty member said, and, and there's budget cuts, so what do you cut first? Yeah. <laughs> some of the, you know, uh, unfortunately some of the electives. Um, I tell my students and faculty that the education is not just in the classroom, so that's a big part of it. Um, it's a lot of what you do and what students do outside the classroom. And so we as a campus and in a college do a lot in terms of community service learning so and, uh, and across campus and really support that and build opportunities for that. And I think that that is a key part of it. Um, some of the other things that the students are out ahead of us is we do a business ethics week that Denise runs um, every November that's become a big draw for corporations as mm -hmm. well interested in this. So we, yes, we teach the accounting and finance and yes, there's case method um, and some other more traditional lecture method. Um, but also that's why I say it comes down to who's in the classroom. Yeah. Both teacher and student. Um, I did a case my first year business school on should you put this African-American, it was black then, 
um, black employee, it was an organizational behavior case in the South, as the first employee in the South, um, when the potential customers would not like that person there. That case discussion was very different because there were four African Americans in the classroom. I worked at Davis for a little bit and I had an African American student come to me crying because she was the only one in the class and they did that case and she felt picked on because she was the only one. Hmm. So it depends who's on the classroom, it depends who your faculty are. You know, I look both for, can't, uh, for college leadership and for faculty, I look for, for people who are a lot like the students. We have a lot of faculty and, and leaders who are first generation. And so that matters a lot too. Peter, do you want to talk, take the, the same question? And, and one aspect I think it would be good to address is the incentives for business schools that don't necessarily align with the sort of teaching that we're talking about here. Sure. So I mean, I'll tell a story. Uh, a few months ago, we were having a dinner at the end of the year to celebrate some of our students. And I was sitting next to this lovely young woman, Princeton undergraduate, uh, Goldman Sachs, came to my school. And she decided she wanted to be a social entrepreneur. She wanted to do the kinds of things that are valued in this, in this audience. It's a case method question. Should I celebrate her or should I be completely despondent about this? <laughs> now I'm a social entrepreneur. I founded, as Kevin pointed out, a social entrepreneurship a, a, you know, a, a firm. Of course I'm going to celebrate her. But of course my, my school will be penalized because of her. Uh, rankings, which is what you know is the bane of every dean's existence, or at least in, in the class of schools that I'm at, 40 or more, 40 to 50 percent of your ranking is salary and salary growth. So God forbid if your students go off to do social enterprise, God forbid if they become entrepreneurs, you will, you know, basically, you know, be damned because of that. So my students, on you know, upon graduating, basically make about sixty thousand dollars a year less three years out than. Stanford students. Um, the only way to close that gap is to send most of your students to finance and consulting yeah. and make sure that they stay in North America and Western Europe. That's it. It's the only way to close that gap. So if you want to do the right thing, and I feel that we are trying to do the right thing, then you celebrate these young people. And in fact, as many as 20% of my students go off and, and to do startups, and many of them in the social enterprise space. But we are going to have to will take a hit because of that, because the metrics in my world say that that's a bad thing. Mm. So that's, that's you know, one specific thing that, that is quite irritating. The editorial policy of these newspapers is to make a big deal and to celebrate students who do these remarkable things. So I can tell st stories of my student who went off into India and found a way to create jobs for people who were um, deaf and therefore couldn't find jobs, or I can celebrate my students who are in Tanzania creating an alternative energy company. But the truth is, is that they're all killing my school. Mm. But see, this is why when we talk about the ecosystem and the disruption that needs to happen, what you just described is the case for why there has to be disruption. Mm -hmm. So what we are interested in at Ford is, is how do we get at the root causes of problems? And so the problem you just identified is that we have a corrupt rating system. Mm -hmm. and, and in order for this problem to be identified and really addressed, we have to call it what it is. The, the hard part of that is that there are enough who understand how to game the system and know if you have ever worked in a university or worked with a university president, you know how to game the system. And so we know what the inputs are to those rankings and we know that they can very easily be manipulated and they are manipulated by people who, who are people of integrity and goodwill, but who are caught, who are trapped in a system. And so what we're interested in is how do we disrupt that system? So I would be very interested in how Ford could help support innovative, courageous people who want to disrupt that system and who also at the same time, in parallel, want to valorize and lift up. Because part of the reason that young woman from Princeton came to you was because, because, because she had heard, mm -hmm. you do have a reputation for 
producing those kinds of leaders. And she wants to be that kind of a leader, irrespective of what some rating book tells her. So we need to valorize people like her and you and, and show an alternative to and, to and to talk about why this is so highly valued in a, in a society. So I'm, I'm, um, I guess I'm much more um, interested in how we solve the problem because we all know across a host of areas that the problem is, um, and it's, it's really hard for us. I mean, it is, you're in, in the UK, but I mean, I think in America, it's, it's really hard. I was in a conversation recently and, and someone it was in a dinner party and someone said, oh, well, Darren's been working in Africa and this person turned and said, oh, it's just so awful over there. They just, they're, they're, the, it, how hard it must be to work there. Their system is just so corrupt. And I hear these stories about how, this person runs a big business, I hear these stories about how they uh, have to basically, you have to carry uh, money in, in, in suitcases in Lagos to get, da, 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 to get the politicians to do that. And I said, well, we have the same system here. <laughs> it's not, I, no, I, 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 I said, it's, it's just legal. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's no, I mean, it's, it is, it is, and so, but what was so interesting was how hard it was. I mean, this is a table of successful Americans. And so when I said that, it was almost like I was a skunk in the room. Yeah. Because, I, it, I mean, it's corrupt. It's just legal. And so can we just call it that? And then, because we all, we all feel, we feel that. We feel that it's been corrupted. And you, as a person who's a person of integrity, leading a major world-class business, you know that system that everybody every year waits to see and to pass out and to proudly, I'm number two, we're number. Except us, we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. I mean, you know, it's a benefit of being a second tier yeah. business school, a, you know, public institution. We're not the University of California. We're California state system was written into our mission that we are there to teach the future populations of California. And yes, our faculty do great research as well, but they're not, you know, the incentives are different. Our faculty are incented and judged based on research, teaching, and service equally. So we don't, and there's a benefit to that. But we're very proud of the fact that last, beyond gray pinstripes, we're number 16. <laughs> 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 and we say we're 16 forever. <laughs> so thank you for <laughs> discontinuing that. But it's true. <laughs> mm -hmm. Darren, one thing, just we're, we're going to move to questions very shortly. Um, but one thing that you've, you've raised and reacted to in the discussion is the yardsticks of success, the measures of success, the house in Martha's Vineyard, the child in Harvard, the, um, the ranking in business school. Are, is there a systemic uh, approach to, to actually subverting those, overthrowing them? What, what's your, what's your, how do you tackle something like that? Well, I think there's a systemic problem. Yeah. That is there a systemic is, solution? Is, well, I think the systemic solution is there has to be movement building around um, a more inclusive society, one where the metrics for success are not necessarily, they can include, but they shouldn't exclude so many of the intangible things that bring us joy and beauty and and happiness in other ways that these material things can't. And again, I'll be, you know, I don't want uh, anyone to misinterpret. Uh, I mean, I've got a closet full of Hermes ties. I would in <laughs> no way <laughs> pretend on any level to be holier than thou on these issues. But I think that there is something fundamentally wrong in our culture that is that has been corroded by. And for those of us who live globally, yeah. you can see it because, Peter, I see the same patterns in other parts of the world. So when I'm in India, it is palpable the values of America around so many of these things. Every middle class Indian's ideal of the dream is to have a little villa with your own little pool in the back. And even if it's a one-tenth of an acre plot of land 
and to have a two-car garage. I mean, there, there just are a set of, and if you're really rich in India, it's to have an over-the-top skyscraper house, right? I mean, it is, we know that, so what worries me is that there is a globalization of the value set, and much of this is propagated um, and modeled by our culture. And I think, so the, the answer is, so that's the diagnosis. The solution has to be the kind of disruption that, that can only come from top down and bottom up. Mm -hmm. And I think we are seeing some of that today. And that's, that's part of why it feels um, so destabilizing right now. Because I think we, we feel it. We feel not just what's happening in the Middle East. Take that off the plate. I think we feel destabilized in this country because we know that there has to be a new normal, mm -hmm. but we haven't figured it out yet. So we're going to go to questions. We have about 15 minutes or so. I believe there are microphones. Are there microphones? I'm going to ask you to say your name and maybe the organization or, or institution you're affiliated with. The microphone is back there, so we're going to start in the back and work our way uh, forward. Um, and we have, we have about, There's actually we have two, two. okay, great. Can you, can you find an, the next person for me and then we'll, then I'll, so you, we don't have to wait for the microphone. You can just go down. Okay, go ahead, thank you. Hi, I'm Dave Gallen, I work at Toyota. And I'm really interested in this um, idea that Peter brought up about being hurt by having students, uh, how the school be hurt by having students go into some of these things that are really values-based you know, values-driven um, careers and, and following really what they love and what they're passionate about. And I, I just want to ask the panel, how how can we get past that? How can we get past just just the financial? Because I don't think we're gonna, gonna, going to get away from the three years after business school, how much are you making kind of measurements, but how do we go beyond that to include how happy you are three years after <laughs> to, you know, wh what are some of the measurements that could be used and, and how do we pro popularize those going forward? I, th I think part of, I'm sorry, Peter. I think part of it is what Peter said is Peter needs to feel comfortable celebrating that student and we all do. And uh, it has to be okay for, for students to fulfill their dreams. I'll be real honest, half the time I'm happy when my students get a job and they get something that fulfills them and that makes them interest. It's their parents who are usually pissing off, frankly, when they take some of these jobs. Everyone thinks their kid needs to be an accountant. Um, but, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about it, celebrating it, you know, bringing them back to talk to current students about what they did that was outside the box and different. Peter? So, I mean, as Linda points out, you celebrate it, but I think you also have to model it in what you do. And we've changed our entire curriculum. So let me just, give you one specific example. Uh, business school curriculums, of course we did finance and accounting and all that kind of stuff. But a core part of any curriculum is strategy. Strategy tells you where to find opportunities fundamentally to make money. So we have an entire course which is where are the opportunities in the world where business can have the biggest positive impact? Which is different than the strategic question, where are those places where there's an ability to find a competitive advantage and make money? So for example, my students study about demographic change because it turns out that demographic change is driving the world. And if you want to have a fundamental impact on the world and make money too, understanding that is important. My students are required to learn about natural resource scarcity. Why? Because fundamentally, the, you know, the Coke question that you heard today, um, you know, if you talk to Cokes or SAB Miller or any of those firms, water is the core ingredient. But if you can understand the issues around natural resource scarcity, you'll understand not only where to make money, but also where it is that business has the opportunity to make the biggest leverage. So for those of you who are business educators, how many of you have a required course that says, here's the places in the world where the opportunities for business leverage are the greatest? <laughs> the, only, the thing I would say is that what we want to do is invest in those alternatives and to disrupt. So there is something called the Social Progress Index, mm -hmm. uh, SPI, which is at Harvard Business School has been, has been working on developing. So we're investing in that and we want to amplify that because we want to regularize and normalize the idea of, a, of an SPI the way we have a GDP or any other. 
because until we can actually capture and measure, it's really hard to talk about an alternative view. We are investing in something called the Sustainability Accounting Standard Board. Some of you know about SASB. Mm -hmm. it's, we need to do that because all the good guys and gals, <laughs> CEOs, who are trying to do right on the sustainability front, they don't have an agreed upon metric for reporting that they're doing good. And so we've got to have a system that allows them to, and so we got to get the SEC to, to recognize it. I mean, so you invest in that, you invest in media, you take SPI and you match SPI with a media partner that matters to millennials, and you drive it into the water so that millennials say, what's our SPI? Before they say, what's our GDP? GDP. So that's how you change culture and behaviors over time. So that's the stuff that a foundation can do, and we are doing it and need to do it more. Take the next question over there. Yep. Hi, Betsy Zeidman with Strategic oh, hi, Impact Betsy. Solutions. Hi, hi Darren. <laughs> um, I just want to pick up on something you just said about millennials. So I do a lot of work in the social investment, socially responsible investment community, and millennials are the talk of every wealth advisor out there because those are the impending customers, and there's this sense that they're going to demand different things from their investments, and that's going to be the thing everybody's been waiting for that's going to change what people are demanding from their investments. And I'm curious as to how you see that in business school, because those are also the people who are feeding in business school. So when you talk about the pressure from the rankings, the, the cus your customers are these students. And as you see millennials coming in, um, obviously San Francisco State is a unique case, but in the more mainstream business schools, do you see that pressure? I'm Do you sorry, see that we're demand? a mainstream business school, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. 6,000 students yes, in California. I are. think we're mainstream. Okay, I, I lived you. in California for 25 years, so you are. But I mean in terms of, let me say, traditional. Do you see that demand coming? Definitely. So, you know, our students are looking for more than, and maybe it'd be because they're coming to Oxford, but they're looking for more than simply the same kind of education that would find them a job in a private equity firm or a hedge fund. Some of them want to do that too, don't get me wrong. So we're definitely seeing that. But the thing I'm worried about, so, uh, you know, I grew up in the, you know, I was born in the 50s and then grew up in the 60s and early 70s. There was this generation in the 60s that we thought was going to change exactly. the world too. Um, and it, it hasn't exactly played exactly. out the way that we thought it. <laughs> I, I agree. So I would agree that there's, there's an interesting thing going on in millennials, and they are certainly putting, I think, very healthy pressure. And as a dean, I love that pressure because, you know, typically, you know, if I can push from the top and the students can push from the bottom, we might get the middle to move. Um, that's the part of the faculty that says they don't work for deans, by the way. Um, <laughs> that was the session that some of you were in. Um, so that's really healthy. But whether that will sustain over 20 or 30 years, I don't know. I think it's a cop-out. I think it, it, we know that if these young people are, are fed into a system, you'll have exactly what happened in the 60s happen. Because when you talk to people, they will tell you, oh, yes, I, and then I, I got to what, name the industry. And, and in order to, in the industry, do well, I needed to, and uh, somewhere along the lines, my values got, and so you hear this, and so to, to expect, which is what, Betsy, you said it very well, this is what we read, and we say, but millennials are different, and, and, and I, well, you read it a lot, don't we read it a lot? And it is, it is as if, de facto, the problem will be solved sustainability, climate, I mean, all of these things there now will have greater salience because today they have salience for a population of people in a snapshot poll, you know, when they're 24 years old. I, I'm not sure without a deeper engagement on the issue, we're going to actually see the return. And there's one place where I do have hope because I have two millennials who I gave birth to is, uh, <laughs> um, this recession, we didn't have growing up in the 60s, 70s. We, we grew up in times of prosperity. And, you know, that is one thing that I see different with my children and their friends. And, you know, and particularly with all the education that the parents invested in, it's a different world out there. And they're much more skeptical than we were. You know, it was, it was kind of easy for us to kind of take the job and go into the system. 
you know, I, I, you know, not data driven, but just anecdotally, and I see that they're challenging things more and questioning things. And you know, it's interesting I bring in politics, but everyone talks about Obama, are you happy or not? You know, I've raised two young African American men who hate Obama. And I think that's wonderful. <laughs> just so you know, and, and you know, I tell them, don't say that to your grandmothers because they're just glad he's there. <laughs> don't say that to your mom and dad who had to work to even, so there's certain, I think it's great that these millennials can look at our president critically, regardless of what he looks like. So I do have a little bit of hope, so, but ask me in 10 years. <laughs> so. Take another question. Yeah, the microphone right. back uh, there. Yeah, yeah. Ron, Ron Berenbaum, New York University. Uh, first, a quick comment and then a, a question. Uh, the comment has to do with uh, the relative corruption of Africa and the United States, Botswana, and uh, the U.S. Have, are approximately the same place on the transparency corruption uh, perception index. And uh, I, I was in Botswana. I didn't have uh, an opportunity to meet any uh, Supreme Court justices while I was there. Uh, but I suspect that may be the reason why uh, uh, Botswana is highly competitive with the United States when it comes to perception of corruption. Uh, by the way, Botswana is the best in Africa. But my question has to do with this, primarily the United States, it may be uh, different in other parts of the world. There's two words that I haven't heard mentioned in any of these discussions that I think uh, drive much of uh, student perception and student behavior and student interests. And those two words are student loans. Uh, and what happens is, uh, do they got to pay these things back? Now, I am the parent of a millennial, and uh, uh, so uh, her tuition in nursery school, nursery school, uh, and this is this was this goes back about 33 years or 32 years. Her tuition in nursery school was more than my tuition for three years of Harvard Law School. Uh, these kids have to pay these loans back. What do you, what do you expect them to do? Go out and herd uh, sheep in New Mexico? I mean, that would be nice, but let's look, maybe this let's is a real problem. To that. And the most disruptive thing you could do would probably be to reschedule or forgive a great many student loans. Do you want to take it to So I'll answer this from an international perspective. There is no student loan market internationally, none. Every bank has exited the student loan market, so if you're a global student trying to go from one, one country and, and, and study in another, there is no loan market at all. We put our school's resources, our reserves, at risk to loan money to students because every bank has walked away from that market. So this is a high-class problem. Unfortunately, it's not the problem that we face. Um, so I mean, and in the United States, you know, it's a, it's a complicated, uh, most most students are not in um, private schools. Most students are at land grants and community colleges. And I think, the, the again, going back to the systemic challenge, is that those institutions are no longer, through the public process, through public legislators, supporting. I'm a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin. When I was at, at 25, 30 years ago, over three quarters of the university's resources came from the legislature. It's now 20 percent. Well, where has the money come from? It's come from tuition. And, and so it's just passed on in the form of debt. So it's the taxpayer offloading what is the public commitment to education onto the individual. And, and so that's what's happened. And, and so, so that to me is a systemic issue. So what we do through our work here in higher education is to support both access and success strategies, but also public advocacy to bring attention to what has actually happened. And at its core, the root issue is that. And, and we do have that problem. Um, and it only costs about $20,000 to go to San Francisco State with living expenses. Um, I mean, it's a big problem because of the type of students that we have. 
Um, one of the things that we're trying to do is we are, we are turning to corporations and industry to be partners with us. My number one fundraising goal is reaching out to industry to provide scholarships, jobs, internships to help finance this pipeline that they tell me is so important. Now, I, I have a huge benefit because of the type of school I am. I, I am blessed to have hospitality and tourism in my college, for example. I am totally blessed because it's a big industry in San Francisco. So for example, so we went to Marriott Foundation, they gave us a big chunk of, of money to support that. Same thing with commercial real estate, but that's, that's my number one focus. Um, it's ironic, because what, what we haven't talked about, which is part of it, is that you know, there's a lot of media about the technology firms and lack of diversity. So I went to one of the founding executives of Google and his wife, and they gave us a huge amount of money to start working on the pipeline of students and base, to help students so they don't graduate with as much loans as they otherwise would have. But I agree, that's where the disruption needs to happen. And that, that comes down to all of us, wherever you live, locally, the federal government, to push on that, and definitely. Have, but where are, where are our university leaders and deans and law school deans and B school deans on this issue? Where are their voices? And their voices are muted. Their voices are muted as I recently in a conversation with the university president and we were talking about inequality and she made a comment that uh, they appreciated a, a, a talk that I had given where I talked about inequality and made a point about it. And, and I said, well, you know, there was that was a time in our society when university presidents used to call out injustice. And they said, we can't do that anymore. Our, my trustees would have my head. I, I've got a capital campaign to run. And if you want me to say what you said about inequality, they'd have my head. Okay, maybe we are non-traditional. We've got to get you out to meet <laughs> President Long. So we gonna, do that. We're going to have to stop here, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, one more question. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. Uh, well, I have a number of comments, but uh, I want to give an example of uh, a leader of a big corporation, probably the biggest corporate, public co uh, private corporation by asset size uh, in this economy, uh, who is a member of the generation that we're talking about, and uh, his name is Jamie Dimon. This person um, controls a lot of resources and a lot of has a lot of political power. Uh, and I have tried uh, to uh, disrupt uh, his life uh, in the last <laughs> few years, as well as his uh, regulators, um, and to limited success. Uh, but one of the questions I asked uh, somebody who knows him, who is his deep uh, insider in this industry, but no longer works there, is essentially, what's his problem? And the answer was, and this is relevant to business education, is he's not a big picture guy. This is sad. This is very sad. And I feel that, I'm not money from Stanford, by the way, uh, <laughs> that uh, two things. First of all, the business school students do not get the big picture uh, as they take our courses. Uh, they get a very limited picture. And secondly, they get knowledge that unfortunately can be used against the rest of the public um, because the rest of the public doesn't have that special knowledge and doesn't even understand the words that they are saying. And so uh, as a result, we need to educate the public to challenge these people and these people to have a bigger picture. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done on both of these things, but I'd be interested in your views if you have time, otherwise we can take it up. Because we are, we are just Absolutely, I think the big picture is the thing that's lacking. We teach them finance skills, accounting skills, marketing skills, operation skills. Um, for example, with water. Yeah, we say externalities as if that, that term by an economist means everything that they need to understand, but it doesn't at all. They need to understand these phenomena at a much more deep level. And are we surprised, I mean, I, I have to just say this, yeah. I don't know Mr. Diamond, but but I do know some CEOs like Paul Pullman and Indra Nooyi and who I think are models and are iconic when I think about the kind of leader I would, I love to see in America. And they are terrorized by near-termism. 
their lives are made miserable by quarterly earnings reports and analysts who watch their every move. And if in a, in a week or two weeks something happens with the stock, that's the world they live in. So I don't know Mr. Diamond, but I'm actually not surprised that what incentive does he have to actually take the long view in a system that seems obsessed with short-termism. And I, I'd go back to, it depends on who's in the classroom, and this is where I'll pick on the top-tier schools. Think about who you admit, because our students do talk about the big picture in terms of big problems, because they live it, or have lived it. So, you know, Stanford, Harvard, Wharton, NYU, think about who you're admitting and who's sitting in that classroom. We're gonna end that, uh, the discussion there. We could go on. <laughs> Um, with that, we can go on for a long time. There is a, uh, a part of the program now, an award ceremony. Judy's going to come back up. And then there is a cocktail hour here, so we encourage you to keep your questions. There are a lot of questions that we didn't have time to get to, unfortunately. So thank you to this great thank panel. You. Thank you. Thank you. Well, while we're waiting for Darren to come back, um, I just want to say a few words. I'm Nancy McGaw, Deputy Director of the Aspen Institute Business and Society Program. I thought that was really rich and engaging. Uh, but what I have the honor of doing right now is recognizing this year's um, Faculty Pioneer Award winners and finalists. It's such a treat to be able to do this. We've been recognizing pioneering faculty um, at Aspen since 1999. These are superb scholars and exceptional teachers who are, I think, the kinds of people Darren might refer to as the disruptors. And they've really been bringing critical questions about the purpose of business and business success into their classroom. Uh, we're going to recognize this year's finalists and winners, but I think we have a couple past uh, award winners in the room, and I just want to recognize them, too. I think Carrie Liana is there. You could just wave. Um, Andy Hoffman is there. Um, is Prakash Sethi still here? I saw him earlier in the day. I didn't see him in the audience from Baruch. So we are glad to have them back with us. And so tonight we're honoring three of this year's faculty pioneer finalists and two of our winners who are here in person. These are all celebrated academics. I wish I had time tonight to give you the whole picture. Uh, you would hear about their teaching awards, about their contributions to research that's had real impact about their service to their communities and to their institutions, but we don't have time. Uh, if I did have that time, I can assure you, you would be dazzled. And if you want to know more, their bios and also the syllabi for their courses are online at caseplace.org. Caseplace.org. Feel free to peruse it, and you can learn more about these uh, finalists and winners. What I want to emphasize before I introduce them is that all of uh, the faculty pioneer winners and finalists this year have one thing in common in their teaching, which relates to why they're being honored tonight. They are all teaching innovative courses that help their graduate students examine how the private and the public sectors actually work in tandem to create value and solve problems. Now, in these days of divisive discourse and a tendency to look to the other to assign blame, it's refreshing to know that there are faculty who are there who are uh, giving students an opportunity to think differently. 
So what I'm going to do is introduce our finalists and our award winners, and we're just going to ask each to come up after I've introduced <coughs> you and shake hands, get your plaque, and we'll get a photo. So these are photo ops, and I'm just going to tell you again, just give you a glimpse. So first, Anat Admati, whom you just heard. Uh, you may know her new book, The Banker's New Clothes, What's Wrong with Banking and What to Do About It. Uh, it's created waves, as you might imagine, in the finance community, um, but has resulted in opportunities for her to testify before the Senate, have lunch with the President. Um, but for us tonight, the important thing is that she's taking these messages to students as well. And she has long been a member of the finance uh, faculty at Stanford, and she's now teaching a course called Finance and Society that talks about the role of the financial system within the broader society. And I am pleased to honor tonight Professor Admati as a faculty pioneer finalist. You gotta get the photo. Moment for the photo op. You got it? Good. Okay. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce John Mann, the contributions that Professor Mann has made to the field of management are legion. Uh, tonight, we want to call attention just to one course, a course that he developed at the University of Maine where he teaches, and he developed it very interestingly, in partnership with a renowned climate scientist and an expert in federal government policy and legislation. The course is called Abrupt Climate Change, Business and Public Policy. Those of you in academia know what a challenge it is to create courses that are team taught and multidisciplinary, uh, but Professor Mann did it and his students are certainly the beneficiaries. Pleased to honor Professor Mann as a faculty pioneer. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to introduce Barry Mitnick. Uh, Professor Mitnick is a leading scholar of regulation and corporate political activity who has served in leadership roles both at his current uh, institution, the Katz School at the University of Pittsburgh, and also with the leading organizations in his field over many years. One of his courses, called Business and Politics, uh, which he developed since the financial crisis, helps business school students understand and examine uh, the increasing interdependence of business and government. And in this course, he asks students to examine the causes of the financial crisis and the critical decisions that government and regulated firms could make to ameliorate, they could have made to ameliorate that situation and hopefully in the future can make uh, to avoid uh, the next crisis. So we're pleased to honor Professor Mitnick as a faculty pioneer finalist. of this year's faculty pioneer awards come from institutions on opposite coasts. First, let me introduce Ryan Cabinte. Professor Cabinte is Associate Dean at Presidio Graduate School in San Francisco. Calling upon his work as a practicing attorney and also as an expert in private equity, he has designed and is teaching a required course uh, called Market Failure and the Regulatory Environment. In this course, uh, Professor Cabinte encourages students to develop new solutions 
that reach across all sectors. He helps students learn to transcend that mental model that puts business, government, and civil society into silos. And with that mental model, it's very hard to begin to imagine more integrative approaches to creating value and solving problems. Uh, we are delighted to honor Professor Cabente as our 2014 Faculty Pioneer Award winner. Now I'd like to introduce Mary Margaret Frank. Professor Frank is a professor of accounting and taxation, and she's also taken on responsibility for being the academic director uh, at Darden's Institute for Business and Society. In her courses over the years, she's helped students understand that taxation and accounting more broadly at its most fundamental level is actually a public-private partnership, and that it involves government, business, and society. Recently, Professor Frank created a cross-disciplinary course that's entitled the National Debt Seminar. It involves graduate students from seven schools at the University of Virginia. Together, in this seminar, they engage in a discussion about the impact of the national debt on their future. And the course culminates in the production of an online educational video that's aimed at actually raising awareness of the national debt. We are pleased tonight to honor Mary Margaret Frank as a 2014 <laughs> Faculty Pioneer Award winner. very much. I hope that you will uh, stay and join us for a reception upstairs to meet these um, faculty pioneers. Judy, you want to just bring it to a close here? It's been a great afternoon. We're glad you're here, and I think we're all ready for a drink upstairs. Yeah. <laughs>